Great. Thank you, Kat, and thank you for the organizers um, for this introduction. And uh, Christine, great introduction to CAR T-cells. Um, certainly did a lot of work for me uh, in the background. So I'm going to tell you today about what Caliber's approach to CAR T-cells is. If you're not familiar with Caliber, we're a nonprofit research institute right down the road, now associated with Scripps. We have about 140 people, and we sit somewhere between academia and pharma in the case that we take uh, academic-type uh, research and bring it to IND-enabling studies up into IND or Phase 1, and then look to partner to progress these programs further. We work on a really wide range of programs at Caliber. This is only one small part of the work that goes on there. So, uh, again, we, we've had a great introduction to CAR T-cells already. Um, it, it, CARs can be considered a, a dominant bypass mutation. Their introduction of, of, of the SCFE with the co-stimulatory domain and the activation domain, which circumvents the T-cell's normal MHC mediated recognition of antigens. And so that, that's, that's rather interesting. And, and, and today through the talk, what I'm, going to, what I'm going to discuss is how we're leveraging this structure of a conventional CAR T cell, but incorporating temporal control over activation in order to restore some degree of decision making and rest to the T cell activation and expansion. So as we just discussed, there's been remarkable clinical efficacy of CAR T cells, mostly in the hematological space, but now also we're seeing in the solid tumor space. And, it, it, and as we know from the CD19 stories, the significant safety liabilities, CRS, the permanent B cell uh, aplasia that we talked about, there's strange or un, uh, un, un, really undetermined causes of neurological toxicity, and of course we've had some unfortunate fatal off-target events. So Caliber, you know, w when we started to, to see these, these remarkable results and, and approach this, we, we were determined to, to come up with a method to incorporate a safer uh, redirection strategy for CAR T cells. And the way that we've done this is by decoupling the activation domains from the targeting domains. And the way that we've done this is taking a conventional CAR and we have used an antibody-based switch to bridge the CAR to the antigen-positive target cell. So the way that this works is here is a therapeutic antibody. I'm just showing the FAB portion of this antibody. And we've recombinantly engrafted a very short 14 amino acid peptide epitope into this antibody. The CAR no longer targets directly to the antigen, but rather is specific for this peptide. So we've, in effect, created an orthogonal immunological synapse in that the CAR doesn't see any endogenous antigen, sees nothing in the human proteome, and requires this, what we call, switch here in order to redirect the cytotoxicity. So the switch in itself, this peptide theoretically doesn't see anything in the immune system either. We've done an in silico analysis <laughs> to suggest this would have a low probability of raising an ADA response. And so these two components work in concert together, but don't cross-react with other components of the immune system. So, for example, there's, there are, uh, this may be considered something similar to the way an, a monoclonal antibody works with ADCC, except again, we're leveraging the engineering capacity of a chimeric antigen receptor and the potency that's associated with that. So w what can we do with an approach like this? So the goals here would be to prevent severe adverse events in the case of tumor lysis syndrome or cytokine release syndrome. The idea here is that one would give the CAR T cells one single time and the ability to dose that antibody-like switch with a predictable pharmacology would enable one to titrate or tune very accurately the CAR T cell response to the target cell and therefore be able to bring up the level of activity to a therapeutic index rather than turning off the CAR, which has been some approaches that have been out there called kill switches. So rather than turning off the CAR in response to an adverse event, rather we're titrating up or tuning up the activity here. In the case of B-cell aplasia, because these cars are endogenously off, the switches are necessary for activity. Once one stops dosing the switch, we can allow B-cells to come back, and I have some data in syngenetic animals where we show that. And then we found some very interesting results regarding the 
formation and recall of a memory response with CAR T cells enabled by this temporal activation by the switch. In terms of antigen loss relapse, which we just spoke about, this is a universal platform in the case that the car needs the switch in order to target. So the, the, the car is antigen agnostic. If antigen loss occurs, one could take a different switch, a different therapeutic antibody. For instance, if CD19 is lost from a leukemic cell, you could use CD20 or a CD22-based switch. And in effect, you have a hardware and software type approach where the car is the hardware and the switch would be the software. This can also work for heterogeneous tumors. And ultimately, if we can create a universal CAR T cell platform, we may be able to leverage the economics of scale. But also, if we can incorporate a memory response, we, able to, we may be able to vastly reduce the number of cells that are necessary to use and, in effect, use that to decrease the cost, the overall cost of the therapy. So here are the details on how we built this platform. And, and, and the first thing that we did was to create these switches, we created a library or a panel of switches in which we've taken the blue 14 amino acid peptide here and we've engrafted it into different areas in this FAB for the therapeutic antibody. And we developed this at first using anti-CD19 switches because that's where CAR T cells have demonstrated uh, the most uh, uh, or they're most well established with CD19. So this is the identical antibody clone that is in Novartis's approved product for CD19. And the, and the first thing we, we tested was to say, if we put the peptide at the end terminus of this antibody-based switch, it will cause the synapse between the car and the target cell to be short in effect. Whereas if we put the peptide here, we would get a longer immunological synapse. And we can look at this in in vitro cytotoxicity assays where we're mixing target cells with T cells and then titrating in the levels of switch. And we can see nominal differences here where at, when we put the switch uh, with the end terminal configuration or the short immunological synapse, we get a higher potency of cytotoxicity. And we can also look at that in terms of cytokine release. And we can look at that in terms of the valency of the switch. So we can put two of these peptides on it. Now, the important thing here is that binding of the switch to the cell does not activate the CAR T cell. It truly requires a cross-linking event in order to have activation here. And so that's what we show here with CD19 negative cells. We can go 1,000 or 10,000-fold above the EC50 of the switch, and we still don't have nonspecific activation. So we saw these nominal differences in vitro, but what was very interesting is when we took this platform in vivo to a NALM6 model, and this is how we run the NALM6 model, we established disease over six days, luciferized disease over six days. In all the models that I'll be showing you, we give one dose of the CAR T cells, and then we iteratively dose with the switch molecule as a typical therapeutic. In this case, those suboptimally designed switches which had nominal differences in vitro it is absolutely determinant for in vivo activity. So we get complete clearance with the optimally designed switch where we get no clearance with a, with a misdesigned switch. And the reason for this is, again, is that distance between the target cell and the T cell needs to be around 150 angstroms in order to form an optimal or physiological immunological synapse. When it's too long, it'll still cause cytotoxicity, but it causes energy of the cell. The progeny T cells no longer seem to persist in the, in the mouse. We've compared this to CART-19, and this is the same one from UPenn. And in terms of activity, if you quantify the radiance, we have over 96 hours, almost identical decrease of tumor. So we've lost no activity in terms of efficacy when using the switch here. And we see slight differences in the cytokine response looking at IL-2 here in the dotted lines, which I'll discuss. And importantly, again, when we use the car without the switch, we see no activity on the cell. So this is a truly switch-dependent mechanism. So we took this into the NALM6 model in some different dosing regimens. And the first thing we did was to dose every day versus every day versus every fifth day with the switch. Again, only dosing with the CAR T cells once. So the switch dosing here is in the gray. Every day versus every other day, we completely eliminate the tumor. This tumor doesn't come back in the xenograft mice for over 100 days, even though we've stopped dosing. So we, we do believe we've eliminated uh, the tumor. Here, if we uh, stop dosing with some residual tumor burden there, if we stop dosing the switch, the tumor comes back. So this is not a runaway response. We're not activating the cells to go and run away and kill the tumor themselves in these xenograft models, but rather this is a switch-dependent mechanism. When we think about toxicity, we can also do step-up dosing regimens. So we can bring down the dosage of the switch at first tenfold, somewhere around uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.05 rather, and then... Uh, you see a, a correspondingly slightly slower decrease in tumor burden here 
whereas it comes back a little bit at day 30, we're able to retreat with the switch and again eliminate the tumor. So again, CRS is a really big problem. The switch was developed in order to address that. And what we can show in vivo is that we have a very tight correlation between switch dosage and the amount of cytokine release in these xenograft models. So if we dose at 0 0.05, 0 0.5, or 2.5, very tight correlation in the increase of cytokines. Again, CART-19, slightly but non-significantly higher amounts of cytokine release in these models, we're still getting similar efficacy. So we can get greater efficacy even at these lower dosages, we can get similar efficacy, rather, with a lot less cytokine release, and that's the goal here. But what we, were, what we were surprised to find is that the differences in dosing also gave us a different phenotype after the dosing period. And this makes sense because the, the dosing is, in effect, the antigen load or the antigen burden that's on these cells during their expansion. So if we dose lower, in this case, we see a higher CD62L memory population at the end. So we wanted to understand this more, but the xenograft model isn't the best place to look at it. So we rebuilt this platform in syngenaic animals. And when we rebuilt the platform in syngenaic animals, we paid close attention to the co-stimulatory domains, again optimizing the immunological synapse distance by a library of switches, uh, and we're using fully murine components. So this is anti-murine CD19, murine CD3 zeta, uh, and, and murine hinge co-stim and, and transmembrane domains. And, and we took this into solid tumor models, and in these solid tumor models, we can get complete elimination of the tumors here. And what's interesting here is we see the same principles that we saw in our human system, whereas if we design the hinges in this case of the car differently, we see no activity versus, or we see very little activity rather, versus complete 100% uh, survival of the mice with the proper orientation of the immunological synapse. So the, the paradigm here for B cells is that a conventional car would can create sustained B cell depletion, but again, the switchable car should only deplete B cells when the switch is being dosed, and this is indeed what we found. So here, we've quantified B cells on the, on the left, car T cells, car positive T cells on the right. And what's interesting here is that during the first dosing round, you see complete elimination of B cells. Once you stop dosing in this white rest period, B cells return. You can dose with switch again. Now you see an, an expansion of the T cells, but correspondingly a depletion of the B cells. And you can do this over and over and over again. So what we wanted to know is where is this coming from? How are we potentially creating memory, and how might that memory be tied to the switch dosing regimen? So how is the temporal response and the antigen load, just like in a normal physiological response of a T cell, going to form memory or going to form some type of exhaustion or energy? So to do this, we looked at first-gen, second-gen, third-gen cars, uh, which have been well explored, uh, Christine just talked about, in the human models. We've looked at this also in our murine models. And when we began this, no one had really explored 41BB second-generation-based co-stimulatory domains in the murine model. For whatever reason, CD28 was the car that was being used almost ubiquitously by, ubiquitously by folks uh, to study this syngenaic model. So we did a lot of work in understanding how to incorporate the murine 41 bb and the murine CD28 41 bb co-stimulatory domains in a way that they would be physiologically relevant to our human platform that we've developed. So in this case, uh, you can see here, looking at the number of T cells, again, with this, with this same schematic where we're dosing with switch iteratively during these dosing periods, single dose of CAR T cells, you can see we're expanding the number of T cells. And over this time, you can see the third generation has a slightly greater expansion potential over time, which is interesting because some of the CAR T cell products uh, that are out there are, uh, are finding that they don't have persistence and you're losing or deleting cells from periphery. Again, this is a syngenaic model, so we do know that we're not getting, we don't believe we're getting an ADA or an elimination of the cells that, that are being immunogenic in this case. So uh, again, I think the most interesting thing that we set out to find here based on those results is again, if we change the switch dosing regimen in effect, changing the antigen load on the cells, how does that change the expansion of these T cells? And so we set up a model where we were looking at uh, CAR T cells and B cells in these syngenaic animals, where we dosed four times with low amounts of switch or high amounts of switch, or we dosed eight or 12 times, again, looking at low or high. So we're crossing the two dosing paradigms. And what we find here is really remarkable. 
During this phase, we're dosing. This should actually be a color here. So these are all different dosing paradigms. We're resting here in white. And then here, we're resyncing the cells by starting all of the dosing regimens at the same time again. So they have different dosing and different rest phases in here. What you see is with the identical CAR T cell construct, you see a more than 500-fold greater expansion of cells depending on how they have memory of what they were dosed before. And we can look at the phenotypes of these cells, and we can show that this is a split axis here. We're seeing a massive expansion of effector memory population at day 35 during, at, right after the resyncing of dosing. But once we rest these cells and look again, the effector memory population has gone under a significant contraction while the central memory compartment has correspondingly a much smaller decrease. So we've not only created memories here, but we've been able to effectively recall them, and we can recall them iteratively to deplete or to expand um, the T cells and B cells in these animals. So uh, very quickly, I'll take you through what we can do with this model in terms of antigen loss relapse and the, university of, uh, the universality of this model. So we've shown everything in context of CD19 to date, but the idea here is that the car, because it's target agnostic, can target anything based on what the switch is. And so here we've developed a platform where we can clone and test any given uh, therapeutic antibody in switch format here in about a month. And so here, we're using ofatumumab-based switches to create anti-CD20 switches. The very interesting thing here is that this is the opposite orientation of what we found for CD19. So for CD19, we found we needed a switch design which makes a short immunological synapse. For CD20, you also need that short, short synapse, but because the epitope for this antibody is membrane proximal, it's a Goldilocks principle where it's got to be about 150 angstrom. Too far is bad, but too short encounters steric hindrance. So it's an interesting synthetic biology story, which I don't have time to get into today, where we've empirically developed what the optimal switch orientation is for every given antigen. So once we have two antigens or two switches here, we can look at relapse-based models. So we have a highly persistent system that we can also recall and multiple switches. So we've taken this into a, a host, I think more than a dozen different targets to date. And we've developed this RAGI model. So RAGI is endogenously CD19, CD20 positive. So when we challenge for the first time with RAGI cells, again, the whole model has one dose of CAR T cells. We dose with the anti-CD19 switch. Again, just like we saw in our NOM6 models, we completely eliminate tumor but we can re-challenge them with CD19 negative, CRISPR knocked out CD19 negative Raji cells. You see that CART19 here has no effect against the tumor, but all we need to do is dose with a different switch, in this case an anti-CD20 switch, and we completely eliminate the tumor once again. So this is one method that we might be able to treat antigen loss relapse and heterogeneous tumors. We have taken this into a number of different solid tumor models, including, including PDX models for pancreatic cancer. We've taken this into CLL1 positive tumors. We've taken this into breast cancer tumors that are both orthotopic and subcutaneous. And in each case, we're able to completely eliminate these tumors in xenograft models and solid tumors in syngenaic models in the, co in the context of a competent immune system. The very last thing I'll tell you today is that we, we, we're not restricted to targeting with antibodies. We can also target, for example, with imaging agents. DUPA is an imaging agent for prostate cancer. If we uh, put that peptide on there, we can get very similar levels of cytotoxicity. And we can also target intracellular antigens by using soluble TCRs. Again, affixing the peptide to the end of it, now we're creating that cross-linking event. So we're expanding this platform quite significantly. We've taken this forward now um, and developed humanized clinical candidates that we're bringing forward. We've been fortunate enough to be supported by the Wellcome Trust, and we believe we can get to a clinical POC by early 2019 here to demonstrate, again, that we're seeing a decrease in CRS. We can tune or titrate the response. And again, we have that PD marker for ALL or CLL leukemia that includes B cell depletion. So uh, a, a great team over at Caliber that's developed this in collaboration with Scripps and a number of other groups um, funding, and we're putting out uh, a couple of new publications in the next month. Thank you.